new material for some of the uh, of those that are joining us that haven't heard the story yet. So really, this is just getting that story out. And when we think of uh, generosity on a continuum uh, in your business, there's there's kind of maybe single A, uh, triple A, and the big leagues uh, or levels of depth. We're going to give you kind of the big league uh, Z on the alphabet story. You might be over in here at A, where I was 15 years ago, and I heard Alan's story for the first time at a generous giving conference, and I thought he was nuts. <laughs> I still kind of think he's nuts. No, uh, it, it, Alan is just going to share his story. There are these sort of levels, just to quickly define them, I think, uh, on the lower level, you know, if you're just getting started, maybe think about a donor advised fund or giving appreciated stock. Uh, level two uh, really might be if you've got a piece of real estate or a business interest and before you sell it, donate a piece of it before you sell it and avoid the capital gain. And then level three is what we're going to talk about today, kind of the big leagues where Alan has given a, uh, an operating interest in his business. Uh, all of the profits uh, after they reinvest in the business and pay everybody uh, go to the kingdom. So you may not be there, but we just want to inspire you by this conversation to start somewhere. And, uh, and we're happy to have a continued conversation, put it in the chat. I'm sure uh, Steve can get you my information. Steve, be happy to talk to you. I know Alan and I are, are working on a book project with another guy about telling the story and inspiring people to think more about this. So without any further ado, uh, thanks again, Alan, for joining us. And uh, I'd really just love to start maybe with uh, this story of, of taking over the family business. Can you kind of talk about that point, sort of what you were talking about with your parents, your brother who, who kind of took it over with you, and, and even your wife or soon-to-be wife? Maybe start there. Right. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for letting me be here and, and tell a little bit of God's story. It's been exciting to be part of it. Um, you know, back in the early 80s, when I got out of college and started in the family business, I, I read through the scriptures to see what it had to say about money and realized it said a lot. And my two primary takeaways there were, one is the whole concept of stewardship. I'm, I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. Everything I have has come from God, belongs to God. Um, and, and the second one was a fear of business success, that, that, that business success might be detrimental to my spiritual life. As I saw warning after warning in scripture about money, uh, including a lot of warnings from Jesus, uh, some of the parables were very uh, difficult to hear and, and uh, just realized that um, there was a danger in this whole area of money. So when my brother and I just started talking about becoming partners and, and um, taking over the business from my parents that, that were leaving, we, we talked together about those verses and about how we could put some safeguards in our life so that business success wouldn't be detrimental to our life. And uh, so before we, before we became partners and before we started the, uh, into business um, as partners, we, we put some safeguards in our life. And uh, the first of those was a, a, a concept of stewardship, basically saying this is God's, everything we have is God's, and including this company. And we're going to view it that way. And with our wives, we committed to that. And, and then the second concept was um, how to safeguard ourselves against wealth and against some of the negative effects of wealth. And so we decided we'd put a cap on our lifestyle and, and not see business success as a call to increase our lifestyle, but instead leave it at a fixed level. And if God chose to prosper the business to, to be able to then use those uh, additional funds for to further the kingdom. And so those were our, that was sort of our initial, the initial commitments we made um, before we got started back in 1986. Yeah. So I love that. And, and I think one of the questions everybody's going to have is, you know, how exactly did you set this up? What was the journey like? But maybe if you don't mind starting talking about the conversation you had with, with your wife, uh, because I know we, we know that marital harmony is important and uh, being on the same page. So she, God was working on her too. And I think that's, can you kind of share a little about that decision, how you made it together with her as well? Sure. Well, yeah, my wife, Catherine's an amazing person with a, with a tremendous uh, personal faith and 
So it was not at all a uh, needing to persuade her about this. What the the topic that we had, we were we were before my parents announced they were going to leave the business. My wife and I were going to do a stint on the mission field, and so our our biggest conflict really was. Uh, should we forego that and and start this business, or should we let my parents sell the business and and go on the mission field? And she she was very anxious to go on the mission field, so she she was not at all um, uh, reluctant to commit everything that we had to the Lord. And um, and then the the steps we've taken since just were sort of natural progressions of that commitment. Exactly. And so, so my wife and I've been married for 35 years and we've never argued about money. And, and I think it's a byproduct of putting them in perspective. And so it's been a blessing for us and not a, not a curse. Well, I really like the way you talked about at first, it was sort of protection, you know, you, yeah. when you read those verses, right. Uh, uh, that, that money can be the root of all kinds of, of problems. It's just a tool like anything else. But just to put those safeguards, I like that safeguards. We use guardrails a lot, you know, in place. And, and now we're kind of getting into the blessing. So can you talk a little? I know people are curious about how you sort of set your salaries and sort of how you started with it. And then maybe we'll talk about the evolution of how you started papering this, this ownership. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Our, our basic concept was one of stewardship and with no entitlement to anything. I use the illustration of the army cook and say that the army cook shouldn't eat better than the rest of the troops. And yeah. I feel like I'm part of a kingdom army, if you want to call it that. that maybe we shouldn't use militaristic terms, but but part of a, the body of Christ and the fact that God has put me in a position to generate income um, because of my aptitudes or my where I live or my opportunities that have come my way doesn't mean that I have the right to consume it. And so um, we, we set our salary based on what we would consider a reasonable consumption level um, as opposed to something that would be in keeping with the traditional uh, compensation of a CEO. And so um, as the years went along, we have six kids. And so as the number went up as we went along and now the number's coming down. So our salary has decreased uh, substantially over the last few years as our kids are no longer um, on the payroll. So I think, I think this is an important point. One of the things we always bring up to business owners is in, in this kind of discussion about generosity, kind of figuring out where your financial finish line is. So, I mean, I think you starting out early set it pretty low and didn't develop kind of a high run rate of expenses. And so it was easier for you to kind of regulate that over time because you just never let it get to, to a big level. I know people listening are at all different ages and stages. So maybe just walking them through. I've heard you talk about that you kind of set your initial salary as kind of what missionaries would make, right? Is that is that fair or something close to that? Similar, yeah. And then everything over that you gave away. So that first year, you mind sharing ballpark, what do you think you gave away 36 years ago or whatever the first year was that you took over the business? I think our first year we actually made a little money and we gave away fifty thousand dollars, which was which was more than our salary. We were amazed that we had made any, you know, I was a 25 year old kid. We didn't know if we'd even survive the first year because it was a mom and pop business, mom and pop left. And, uh, but, but God provided. And so we, we gave away money and, you know, we've never given away a nickel that God hasn't provided to us. And over the years, he's provided more and more and we've been able to give more and more, but only because God has provided it. So we, we, it's not ours. It's uh, it's his. Have you have you seen this? I love that. Have you seen? Uh, how do you think about this journey? You, this sort of adventure. I almost think of it as, as an adventure you're doing with God, where you sort of cut this deal with Him. Where look, it's your. It's a full acknowledgement of the truth. We often we've done these interviews before. We're, we did one last week where we called it papering the truth. You know, when you actually <laughs> document. Uh, that God, whether whether we acknowledge that God owns it all or not, doesn't really. It, he still owns it, <laughs> whether we acknowledge it or not. So early documentation or, or acknowledgement of this. So talk about that adventure, because I think the other thing is the freedom it leads to. Yeah. And I think you're the such an interesting example because you've lived this for so long, so many decades that 
you know, how will this kind of turn out? So may, can you talk a little of the adventure that you feel and the freedom maybe uh, of being on that adventure? Yeah, I mean, people, people might hear this and think, golly, what a, what a hard thing or what a difficult thing. It's not been that at all. It's not been some hard struggle of discipline to do this. God has provided a rich, abundant life, and he's allowed us to be part of uh, his work with some amazing brothers and sisters who are so much more godly than I am, so much more committed than I am, and we get to be part of what they're doing. That's been so much more fun than any of the toys that I would have ever bought, and so it's not been uh, a, a life of struggle and hardship and obedience. Um, I mean, there's elements of that, of course, but the the there's also elements of a rich abundant life that's which is what we've found and so it's uh um all the good stuff in life is free and and we have enjoyed so much of it um and god has been so good to us that it's it's not been a, a hardship well you sort of referenced uh you know the the things that maybe the world uh values that you've had to give up and that sort of thing it made me think about uh, the story you've told of uh, your son uh, when, when he wanted a, a Hummer uh, years ago when that was uh, a popular car and, and that sort of thing. And, and I know you live out in the country. You mind just sharing that story as an illustration of sort of the impact and the discussion you had with your kids about this move? Yeah, I mean, my kids are all human beings and they all see stuff and have see other people having things and, you know, they're human. and. Uh, and we sat down and had a conversation with this one son who was enamored with the Hummer back when that was a cool vehicle and basically said, son, why would we spend that much money on a vehicle when the ones we have get better gas mileage, haul more people, et cetera, et cetera. They're more functional. But more importantly, the delta between the 100000 it would cost for a Hummer and the 10000 we paid for our used Suburban is, is a lot of money. And think what that money can do um, in those places that, that you visited with us. And so we basically um, showed them the alternative to being a consumer, be, as being a kingdom investor. And he saw it and he saw the benefits of investing. And, and uh, I think, um, you know, my kids were continued to be human after that, but I think it was a, a watershed for him to say, um, you, you know, the alternative is better than than having the shiny, uh, the shiny toy. And, and I think that that's what I love. I picture you talking about we son. We could lie, Nathan. Of course, I've had the advantage of talking to him, and and uh, he's such a great guy. Uh, but he said you could you could we could line our whole long driveway with Hummers, but then we wouldn't be able to do those other things that we went on that mission trip to do, and and sort of connecting those things in his brain. And and uh, he he told me he was. He said, you know, I figured out when I was in high school, everybody kind of expected me to have a lot of money because my last name was on the uh, on, on a lot of these buildings around town. <laughs> and I sort of figured out, wait a minute, what we're doing is different. It prompted some interesting conversations. But how many of the how many of the kids have worked in the business? How do you think about uh, allowing that to happen or not allowing that to happen at certain points? How, how does this uh, manifest itself with work kids working in the business? Yeah, I mean, I have six kids. They're all they're all invited to come into the business that they want to do that. Um, uh, only one at this point has joined the company. A few others are, are you know, we've we asked them all to go do something else for a time before they would come into the company. And so, um, I had a, my oldest son was in the company for a few years and decided to step out and become a teacher. So um, my second son is involved in the business and. Um, you know, it might be one or two others would join. They're all invited, but none expected. They're all, um, we don't think, see this as our business, nor do we see it as theirs. And so there's no birthright to a position in our company. If they want to come and work hard and, and share the stewardship of the business, that's an opportunity. Um, but it's, it's not an expectation. I love it. Uh, one of the other hot topics, I think, around this idea is uh, the impact on employees. You know, uh, we, we've given our first 10% uh, of the business away at, at Archetype. And when I was interviewing uh, lawyers to kind of paper our side of the deal, we did it with National Christian Foundation as you did. Uh, but 
almost every lawyer I met with tried to talk me out of it. I mean, how are you going to uh, incent people? How are you going to compensate them? All of this kind of thing. Does this require a big sacrifice from all your employees as well? How do you think about the employees on this? Yeah, no, it, I'd say it has been a, a net positive for the employees. I just came from a leadership development meeting we were having young guys who were talking about how they love profit with a purpose and how they love the fact that they're not just, uh, that the fruits of their labor are not just ramping up my lifestyle, but they're having more of a, a real purpose. Um, so I think our employees are feel very favorable toward it. They're not, not the victims of it. We pay our people uh, uh, competitive wages. We give a, a lot of incentives for good work and uh, long-term incentives for guys that stay a long time. And, um, you know, the fact that we no longer are the owners of the company, that we've transferred the stock of the company into a, a, a trust um, hasn't changed anything for our employees, except maybe for them to feel like officially I'm no longer the owner and we're on the same wavelength. So, um, you know, my employees don't feel at all ripped off. I don't subject them to the same uh, salary limitations that I put on myself. Everyone, we pay everyone uh, market wages um, and then encourage them to, we're transferring stewardship to them and encourage them to be stewards themselves. Um, but uh, I'd say there's been no downside for the employees and, and a high degree of upside as they have uh, been excited about the purpose of our business. Uh, I love that. And I think that's key. I, I, that I think there might be a misperception uh, that everybody has to sort of sacrificially limit their salary. And in fact, for the people listening, they might not even have. I mean, you know, you can pay yourself a market wage. It doesn't sort of limit yourself. Uh, I, I was thinking, or your ability to attract talent and, and those kind of things. One of the things I was thinking about is one of the other guys working on this book project with us, uh, with Alan and me, is, is Jeff Rudd. And he's got a great line about after they papered the transaction, and I want to get into that in a minute. I'll be, walk people through a little bit of the transaction. But uh, he said it, when he went to his leadership, you remember the story? He said, uh, first thing he walked in when he announced it, uh, the, the first guy that spoke up about it was, he goes, oh, you're one of us now. Yeah, you're one of us. And, uh, I love that because uh, it, it's kind of like your, uh, uh, your, your army cook example. Yeah. You're, just, uh, you're just an employee like the rest of us and uh, saving for retirement and, and uh, it's God's business. So uh, I really like your uh, perspective on that. So maybe walk people through. We, we talked about the beginning where you sort of just made a deal with your brother and your, and your wife that, hey, let's set our salaries at, at reasonable levels, um, kind of below market, and then we'll give away. But over time, you sort of papered this thing. So I know we got a bunch of business people watching this that are kind of probably intrigued by that. What does that transaction look like? And we don't need to get into all the you know, legalese of it, but just at a high level, what, what did that look like? Yeah, well, I mean, we, by 2008, the company had grown a lot and, and it was a $250 million company and worth a lot of money because we had a lot of profits and the, the whole estate tax thing became a huge issue for us of what if one of us died and, and we realized that you know, as far as the IRS was concerned, we each owned half. We thought it was God's company, but you know, we had that issue. So we, we decided to go ahead and give the company away, put, it, put the company into a trust. I, wouldn't even, I shouldn't say give it away. We didn't give away the company in terms of the, uh, it wasn't like we were giving something away and walking away. We continue to see it as our company. We continue to run it. We continue to push hard and try to have it be a great company. Um, but we've just transferred the stock into a charitable trust. So the only effect really on that is if one day the company is sold, the, the um, proceeds of the business, proceeds of that sale would go to charity and we would direct which charities it goes to, you know, before that, before we gave the company away, we were giving away 50% of our income each year. And we would use half the income to grow the business and half the income we would send out to ministries. Um, we continue to do the same thing now. So it, it, a, a lot did not change. The thing that did change, uh, my personal balance sheet changed a lot. Um, my lifestyle didn't change at all. Um, but the, the thing that, that did change was uh, a freedom, I guess you'd say, that, that if something happened to me, it wouldn't be a catastrophic thing for the company. And um, we have now the, the ability to transfer the stewardship of the company 
uh, to another generation or to a leadership team without having to transfer the dangerous stuff, the, the value of it. And so my kids can come into the company if they want to, to, to be stewards of it, but not ever to be owners of it. And I, I think that takes a dynamical way that's, that's um, pretty nice. And so we're setting the company up to run forever. We, you know, we, we don't have a plan to sell the business. Um, maybe one day we will, but don't have a plan to. And so we think that this allows us to be able to transition really well. It also has some pretty massive tax advantages that we didn't really anticipate when we did the deal, um, but it, it has substantially decreased our tax. Our net effective tax now is about 6% of our income. And uh, that's awful nice. It generates more money that we're able to then use to fund the kingdom. So I think this is an important point, and, and this can get uh, uh, very detailed and, and, you know, there are experts, lawyers out there that we can put you in touch with that are real experts in, in designing these things, but I was just writing down a few e-notes as you spoke. We were working on, on a case at Archetype this morning uh, with a business owner who has got two kids. He went to the estate planning attorney, and all they told him, and this is very common, Divide the, your estate, the total amount, by the number of kids you have, and then we'll just, the only thing you got to decide is when they're going to be their own trustee. That's sort of the, we call that the uh, the world's estate plan, right? Yeah. And they start playing alphabet soup with all these entities and everything else. And most people that we talk to, if you can listen to their story, that is not what they want to have happen. But, but we got to kind of translate that in to say, okay, what does God want me to do? How much is enough for us? How much is enough for our kids? And what do we want to do with the excess? And a lot, most of the time, that's not just divide by the number of kids. If it is, if that's what God tells you to do, do it. But there is a different uh, way to have this conversation. And I think uh, you've got a very unique structure. And, and there's something unique out there uh, for everybody. So I'd say, and you will pay zero estate taxes on a giant asset, by the way. Okay. Yeah. So you're disinheriting the IRS. Okay. Uh, at, at, at an estate level. Uh, which is very rare for a, for a large business to be able to do that and directing those assets to the kingdom. There's also a huge benefit uh, to you get a deduction. You can deduct up to 50 to 60 percent, depending on, on, on the type of assets of your income. So when you donate a piece of the business, you also get that deduction against uh, your personal income taxes as you do that. And then you talked about on an ongoing basis, now that the profits go directly to charity, they don't even hit anybody's tax return. There's very little corporate tax on this. So, and then it also, uh, sort of the, those are sort of the quantitative benefits are actually way more meaningful than people understand. And then I would say the qualitative are even more important, right? This adventure you get to be with, on, with God, with you and, you and your family and the whole company. Uh, to me, the freedom, we always talk about freedom that it gives you. It feels like, well, isn't that restrictive? Not paying yourself much? It actually offers freedom. Uh, the number one question we get uh, from wealthy business owners is, how do I not ruin my kids? That's off the table, almost yeah. by default. Okay. Huge benefit. Yeah. Huge, huge benefit. And so, uh, and then you, it, it also offers you the protection. So the protection for you, your family. I always think about the verse uh, uh, that you can only serve one master. God or money. And, uh, you know, I, I spent a few years of my life chasing money more than I chase God and it led to an empty place. So that's basically what my book's about is God hit me in that empty place and asked me to reverse that. And that leads to a lot of joy. So I just congrats on figuring it out earlier than I did. Uh, and for those out there, uh, you know, we'd love to have those conversations about it. But I think I think another interesting thing, and we'll get to some questions here, probably this is the last question, Steve, if you can start maybe collecting the questions from the chat, but the, the, the last question I would have is about, now you're giving away a lot of money, you can talk about the number if you want or not, doesn't matter, but do you want to talk about how you're giving away the money? That's actually a job unto itself now as well as the money's gotten bigger, hasn't it been? Jeff, you, you went out just a second, could you, Say it again. Yeah, sorry. You just froze for just a second. I was going to say, how do you go about at a corporate level giving away the money? Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, we have a group. Um, we call the Grove Group. It's a group of employees and spouses. Um, well, locally, we have about 50 branches around the country. And locally, we have 
what we call Barnhart Cares teams at the branches, and those and they make decisions about sending money to local organizations. Um, it's relatively small dollars. The the big dollars um, are we fund work internationally in six locations, six six areas, and we have teams for each of those areas. And so we have a, a group of basically volunteers within the company that that take their time to uh, figure out how to invest that money. We would call it investing. We would say we want to do due diligence. We want to make sure that the ministries that we're funding are um, have a good strategy, have a good leadership team, have a good track record, and then we want to invest in them. And then we want to look after our investments and make sure that there's fruit. And uh, so we kind of look at it from a business standpoint. We don't feel like we're giving them something. We don't want them to say thank you. We want them to go out and perform. And and that's, that's sort of the idea. We want to be as strategic in our giving as we are in our making of money. Um, that, that's for the company funds. Now, I mean, our personal, you know, personally, we give to things that are less strategic um, and, you know, give to a friend or give to a, a missionary or whatever. But the, the significant company dollars, we have decided to come up with a process where um, we have a group doing it. I can't make any decisions there. The group makes the decisions. And uh, um, we have found it to really uh, reduce some of the negatives of giving. And giving away money, can you can do a lot more harm than good. And we, we've had to be students of this and try to figure out how to make sure that the dollars that we're sending out are a blessing because the dollars have continued to increase over the years. And um, we've had to come up with more and more people to figure out how to invest this money. But uh, I'd say it's been uh, difficult. It's been a challenge. It's been one of the jobs that God has given us, but it's also been uh, very rewarding, very interesting and fulfilling. Love it. Uh, Steve, are there any uh, questions from uh, the listeners or watchers? Well, actually, the questions that have come up, Alan's already answered them. <laughs> okay. If there's other questions, please. Uh, oh, wait a minute. Here's one. Are there any specific ministry efforts you focus on, such as human traffic, human trafficking, et cetera? Yeah, there, there are of the six areas, uh, four of the areas are geographic. So we focus on, we try to focus on hard areas. So the Middle East, North Africa is one, West Africa, um, Southeast Asia, and Northern India. Those are the four geographies, and we have teams for each of those. We have another team that focuses only on leadership development and then another focus only on Bible translation. So those are our six focuses and we do very little else. We, uh, we say no to 95% of what comes along um, because we have that focus, which has been very freeing to uh, there's lots of wonderful things that we're not trying to figure out if something's good or bad. We're trying to figure out, does it fit within our focus? And, and that's free. And so we, uh, we can very um, gently say no to people to say, I'm sorry, that, that's wonderful what you're doing, but it's just not what God's called us to do. Sure. So I, I think being intentional about your giving is, is pretty important, uh, being intentional about money in general, but also about your giving and not just be a responsive, but, but uh, think it through just like you would in your business. Don't you know, don't be really strategic in your business and then haphazard in your giving. Uh, I think use the same skills. Ministries need um, business people asking them hard questions. I, mm. I think that is, sometimes we do more good for a ministry with our questions than with our dollars. And I, I think it's, uh, we, we push them pretty hard on what is their, how their strategy looks and what their track record is. And, and I think that is, I think we need ministry people and we need the, the spiritual input that they give us and they need us. And, and so it's, uh, it's kind of that arm and foot and leg and uh, we're able to be our, play our part in the body. But uh, we do that by approaching things as an investor rather than as a, a giver. Sure. Uh, here's a question. What does GROVE stand for? The acronym Grove. Grove stands for God's resources operating very effectively, and it's a it's our goal, not a claim, but that's what we'd like to like to see happening. Okay, here's an interesting question: How did you come up with how much to pay yourself? 
<laughs> when you started out. Yeah, I mean, I think the Army Cook is a good a good way to start thinking about that. Basically, I have no I have no rights or no uh, entitlement, but I I do have uh, needs and what what's what's reasonable to function. Uh -huh. And uh, so I think initially our salary was forty thousand dollars. It went up as high as one hundred and sixty thousand dollars when we had a lot of kids, and um, now it's down to a hundred thousand. So uh -huh. it's uh, and we don't we don't consume all of that, but that's that's round figures what our salary is not at all mother Teresa salary this is you know we have everything we need to function it's not I mean we would see it as you know from a global standpoint opulent lifestyle um, but but you know we try to keep it relatively simple um, and have the things that we need to function in our society um, but you know we don't want to invest in the toys. You know, toys are the things that basically feed your ego, um, the stuff that feeds your ego, and we think that's harmful. We want to avoid the toys and and focus on the tools. We'll, we're very willing to invest in the tools. And one of the tools for us has been travel. We've spent a fair amount of money on travel, taking our kids all over the world oh. and exposing them. And so my kids, we never, we didn't take them to Disney World, but we took them to, to, to uh, Turkey and to the Egypt and to uh, Vietnam and to India. And so uh -huh. my kids have, have seen some amazing things, uh, not as tourists, but as, as, uh, uh, as part of our kingdom investing. And uh, my kids don't feel ripped off by missing out on Disney World. They've, uh, <laughs> they've had a great life. <laughs> if you could do it over again, here's a question. If you could do it over again, what would you change? What would you do different? I, I, I would have given the company away earlier. Uh, we lost a lot of tax benefits by not doing it earlier um, and don't have any regrets on giving away 100% of the company. Um, would do that again immediately. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, there's some things about the way that I lived my life and maybe too much focused on work early on and probably neglected my wife some. I'd probably redo a little bit of that better. Yeah. Um, but in terms of, um, you know, we've been 12 years now, I guess 13 years as not the owners of the company. And there's been zero regrets about that or feeling that, man, why did we do that? Uh -huh. um, quite the opposite. It's why didn't we do it 10 years before? Sure. There would have been uh, several million dollars more available for the kingdom if we had. Yeah. Wow. Good point. So here's another one. Uh, what advice would you have for somebody that wants to do the same thing you did? What, what guidance would you give them? You know, I would say, um, uh, I'd say I, I advise it. I, I would, I, would uh, I think find people that know what they're doing and National Christian Foundation really knows how to do it well. And so there's some uh -huh. you know, I's to dot and T's to cross. Uh -huh. um, but I think, uh, I think do it with your spouse, make sure, you know, bring, bring each other along and, and mm -hmm. keep reminding each other why you're doing it. So there's no mm -hmm. uh, hardship. I think um, management, management of expectations for your kids is pretty important. Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, you may not be able to pull that off completely and it's okay if you can't, but if you can, it will be really beneficial. And I think you know, our kids, uh, you know, the, the inheritance that we kind of talked to them about was an inheritance of faith, of work ethic, of education, et cetera. You know, back in the biblical days, the, the, the inheritance was land where you got to go work your butt off to make a living. And, and, um, and that's kind of what we want to do for our kids is to give them the tools so that they can go make a good living. Sure. Um, and so they don't have any expectation of receiving money. Um, but, uh, and, and, you know, there's not a bitterness there because those expectations were set. So adjusting of expectations, I think is important. And, and, uh, and then figuring out how to give the money and, and what, you know, talking to the owner of the money about what it is that he should invest in and getting help with that, asking others. Mm -hmm. We have used several other major donors to talk with them and learn about their strategy. And we run mm -hmm. things by them all the time. We're we do some collaborative giving where we together pool our money. Oh, wow. And uh, so I think um, give, giving away money is not easy. And, you know, kingdom investing is not easy. And, and so to try to do that really well, 
Um, I, and, and again, you know, read some good books. There's a good one called uh, When Helping Hurts that I think was eye-opening for us that some of the things that we were doing was causing more harm than good, both to us and to the recipients. And okay. you know, Christian welfare is just as damaging as government welfare. And wow. you know, we need to be careful that we're not doing things that are hurting people. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I think that uh, those are some of the quick things that come to mind. Okay. Here's a question. Are all Barnhart employees people of express faith? No, not at all. We have about 1,500 employees, and I don't know how many are believers. A whole lot are not. Uh -huh. um, we're a blue-collar business, and um, there are a number of believers, though, that have come into the company because of our purpose or have stayed because of our purpose. So there is uh, more of a, uh, especially among leadership, more of a uh, faith element maybe than you'd find in the average company. We pray together and we um, uh, share our faith. And, you know, we have, we have a, I'd say an active Christian presence in our business. We have chaplains and, uh -huh. but uh, uh, no, not everybody's a believer by any, by any stretch, but a lot of the non-believers are encouraged by the, um, by us giving back, I guess. They, they, they see it as a positive thing, a few negatives, but mostly positive. Sure. Okay, we have one, one last question here, and this is about your kids. Did the kids accept all of this to varying degrees, your kids? Yeah, well, I mean, to, to a degree, I mean, I'd say my kids accepted it because they started really young, but I'd say even if they didn't, um, you know, if my kids didn't want to accept eating their vegetables, they still had to eat their vegetables. And, and, <laughs> or if they, if they didn't want to accept not playing in the street, they had to still not play in the street. I, I think we were doing things to try to help our kids. And I think this whole concept of, of inheritance can be very detrimental to kids. Like winning the lottery can be super detrimental to somebody's life. Inheriting a lot of money um, very often is a real negative. And so uh -huh. we don't think that we're withholding things from our kids. We think we're helping them. And if they were kicking and screaming about it, we would probably do the same thing, uh -huh. um, and, and it, we would we would live with that, you know, in the same way that you would, you know, you'd if your kid was kicking and screaming about not being able to play in the street, you still wouldn't let them play in the street. So, um, but I I don't think that kicking and screaming is the inevitable result, and sure. I think bringing kids along and letting them experience the alternatives and sure. and letting them in on it. Um, four of my kids, I say, have an active faith, two, not so much, uh -huh. um, but uh, I, I'd say that they are, um, none of them feel like uh, they were ripped off. So <laughs> I, I do think it's, I do think we want to, we want to bring our kids along, but if we can't, we, we still don't want them to, uh, if, if, if they can't come along, it's more of a sign than ever that you don't want to leave them a bunch of God's money. Um, Good point. If, if they're really struggling with that, you know, the kids that don't struggle with it are probably going to be fine either way. Mm -hmm. But the kids that um, struggle with it a lot, they, you're really saving them by letting them continue their struggle rather than appeasing them with money. Sure. Wow, thank you. What I, what, what I like about that, just to interject, is that, you know, as one of my friends says, this is what God told you and your wife to do. These are the resources God has entrusted to you, not, not to the kids. What you're not doing is directing your kids' lives. In fact, you've freed them up to not have to work in the business, to get theirs of the ownership of the business. You've actually freed them to follow God's calling in their lives that's what you've done for the kids is the giving them the freedom and you're also obeying God and what he's telling you to do with your resources. So it, it's not a controlling of the kids. It's a freeing of them. So I really like that framing. So. Yeah. Yeah. We do have a question I think we have time for. It. Please discuss Grove lunches in Memphis headquarters. Yeah, we would, we would, um, when ministries are coming to town to, uh, report to us or tell us what they're doing. We'll often have uh, a, a Grove lunch where where they'll come and share with our our team, our staff, um, 
if there's somebody from India, for sure the India team will get together with them. Mm -hmm. And and if they're okay. um, sometimes we'll also do it where the where it's invited, the whole staff is invited to come and free lunch tends to bring people there and <laughs> including non-believers. And we encourage the speaker to share the gospel within their wow. uh, presentation. And so we've uh, done a lot of those over the years. And, and from that people uh, who are not believers still kind of get a feel for what it is that we're investing in. And so we, uh, we want to uh, be able to touch the um, broader group in the company with these Grove lunches. Sure. Well, that sounds wonderful. Sure. Well, Alan, what a blessing it's been to have you on this. Thank you, Jeff. I'm going to put a poll up now for everybody. Some of you have asked if you could have a recording. So I'm going to bring this. Uh, it's actually kind of a survey, really. And um, I don't see it at the moment. So I'm going to have to go back and work on that. It looks like that didn't make it here. But we have one more here. Let's see. Uh, and Steve, if anybody would want to talk more about this, I'm, I'm wide open to conversation. Feel free to just uh, connect with me via an email or whatever. I'm, I'm uh, um, you know, part of what God has me doing really is, is sharing this story and, and I'm wide open to uh, any kind of one-on-one -on -one conversations that people would like to have. Okay, well, that sounds really good, Alan. Well, again, we're out of time here. Thank you very much, and God bless you both. Thank you. Okay, take care. All right, bye-bye.